Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. We're co-presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Did you know that there are at least 80-some elected officials around the country who identify as atheists or humanists? Stay tuned to meet one of these legislators, Wisconsin State Senator Kelda Royce. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. There's only one member of Congress, U.S. Representative Jared Huffman, whom we've interviewed on Free Thought Matters, who publicly identifies as a non believer. But there's a growing roster of elected state legislators who are openly secular, whether atheist, agnostic, humanist. And among these is Wisconsin State Senator Kelda Royce, who served in the Wisconsin State Assembly from District 81 from the years 2009 to 2012, and was elected to the Wisconsin Senate in 2020 to a four-year term. Senator Kelda Royce is also an attorney and the former executive director of NARAL Pro-Choice Wisconsin, who ran for governor of Wisconsin in 2018. So thanks so much, Senator Kelda Royce, for coming on Free Thought Matters today. Thank you for having me. Now, the last time we saw you in person last summer, you were very pregnant. How did that turn out? Well, uh, it turned out great. I have a sweet little four-month baby um, who's my, my third child. Is that his and, picture behind uh, you there? It is, yeah. This is, this is him. Yeah, let's there. take a look. And it he, turned out pretty cute, I think. <laughs> and his name, did you say? His name is William. Uh. Yeah. So we're sorry we can't be with you in person right now during this Omicron surge, but so glad to see you again. Likewise. So to get the semantics out of the way, in terms of religion, how do you identify? Well, I identify as an atheist. Um, I was raised Unitarian Universalist, and um, we also celebrated a lot of Jewish traditions growing up um, on my father's side. And I still uh, sometimes attend Unitarian congregations as well. Um, I think, you know, one of the great things about this country is the diversity of thought and belief, and that includes people being free to not be part of any organized religion. So you were kind of raised in a non-religious household, and but uh, for somebody listening who would wonder why would anybody be an atheist or why you're not religious, what would you say? Well, I think that, um, you know, so often, uh, religion is an important cultural practice that is part of your family structure. And if you are raised in a religion, then it might speak to you in a certain way, even if you might um, not necessarily always agree. I mean, there are a lot of people who remain Catholic, even though they might not necessarily believe Catholic dogma any longer, because the structure of the religion um, and the cultural aspects of it are so powerful. Um, and, you know, for me, I just uh, it never felt like that was something that that I needed. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I love having quiet time to myself and my thoughts um, to meditate. And I love being in, out in nature and being outdoors and, um, you know, experiencing the majesty of the universe. And, uh, you know, and I have a very, very strong belief in trying to make the world a better place and in building a more just and equitable world. Um, you know, a lot of things that I think 
people point to religion and say, you know, this is why it's important to have religion. But I think you can have, um, you know, all of the wonder of the world, all of the sense of purpose and meaning, uh, you know, with religion or without. And some religious people say that without God, you don't have any basis for morality or making moral decisions. What do you say to that? Well, I mean, I think that's just patently false. I mean, there are there are moral and immoral actions that are done in the name of religion, and there are moral and immoral actions that are done without any reference uh, to religion. So, you know, they're two separate things. So, Kelda, Senator Royce, um, what are the upsides, if any, and downsides to running for a public office when you are publicly identified as, a, as an atheist? I mean, I recognize that's not a, a campaign slogan <laughs> that you use, <laughs> but you're not shying away from it. You're public. Um, tell us more about that. Well, I think it depends a lot on your district and on your constituency and also, um, you know, on, on how you talk about it. Um, you know, I, I ran on issues that I thought were very important to my district, access to health care, addressing uh, the pandemic and things like paid family leave and protecting abortion rights and addressing the climate crisis. And all of those issues were important to my district. But when, you know, people would ask me, like, well, where do you stand on um, the First Amendment? Or where do you stand on um, private religious schools getting taxpayer dollars? It was very easy, you know, to say, well, I don't think we should be doing that. We shouldn't have government-sponsored religion. Um, and that is somewhat informed by my perspective as someone who is an atheist. And I don't want um, our tax dollars to go for something that is blatantly unconstitutional to be proselytizing uh, to young people. This county that we live in and which you represent is more than 50 percent non-religious. I think 54 percent. We spoke with the Utah state senator uh, on this show earlier who said that being non-religious was actually an advantage because the voters wanted somebody who stood for those values. Is that true with you, you think? Wow. I was stunned to see how high the numbers were in Dane County and in, in my district. Um, and it was, I think it was you who shared that with me uh, because I've always assumed that, you know, I'm deep in the minority, right? We we're a nation that is really overtly religious um, and specifically Christian in a way that is just not the case in, you know, most other developed nations um, and even other places that I've lived. I lived in Turkey and, you know, Turkey when I lived there was really not, not, it was much more secular than the United States, and people are surprised to think that. But yes, I think, you know, given how much entanglement we are seeing with religion, and specifically a very right-wing brand of Christianity in the government, I think that a lot of us, um, you know, a lot of progressive Christians and a lot of Jewish people and other minority religions, as well as non-believers and humanists, um, are very concerned about what's happening with the Supreme Court and the increasing entanglement of government and religion. And they want people who are going to stand up for constitutional values and the separation of church and state and say religion is for the private sphere. Government shouldn't be interfering with it and government shouldn't be establishing it. Uh -huh. So um, we should and, we should establish that that you live in Madison, Wisconsin, where where the Freedom from Religion Foundation is based, too. And it is a very welcoming home here for us. Um, yes. So, so it's, I think, a, a pretty safe place to be if you're a non-believing candidate. That's true. Yes, it is a safe place to be if you don't have, um, you know, aspirations of, of trying to run <laughs> statewide. You know, obviously, Wisconsin is not completely like Madison. Right. So try running down in Alabama or, or Mississippi, huh? Right. <laughs> right. You know, but even, even those places, I, you know, we're so divided into red and blue, and we don't really realize that every state has deep blue and deep red. Um, you know, it is really that Obama thing, like we're the United States of America, and there are there are Democratic people, very liberal people that live in the most Republican pockets uh, of of the country, and we shouldn't forget about, uh, you know, that that we are still um, neighbors, even though we've sorted into red and blue. Well, we want we want to talk more about those issues um, in a minute, but I wanted to ask who who's endorsed your campaign. You know, have you had support from um, people like Emily's List? Um, yes, I have. Uh, you know, over the years, I've you know I've had a number of different campaigns with a lot of different supporters, and um, 
you know, certainly labor groups, um, women's rights organizations are two key, uh, two key constituencies. And I think, um, you know, just because of the issues that I've worked on and care about and <laughs> campaign on, um, I'm sort of a natural candidate for, for those types of groups. Well, S Senator Royce, with, with three in 10 adults today, according to Pew, identifying as, as nuns, N-O-N-E-S, unaffiliated, isn't there some importance in, in uh, this 30% of the population having our representation in, in, pub, in public officials? Doesn't mean that they Absolutely, only represent yes. us, but why aren't we there already? Yeah, and I think that's especially true given how public a role religion has played um, in public life. You know, I'll give you an example. This week, I had the great honor of welcoming the national champion UW women's Badger volleyball team to the Capitol to congratulate them on their win. They were there for the beginning of session. And the first thing that happens after the call of the roll is a prayer. And this prayer, um, in uh, the way that it is implemented in the state Senate is unconstitutional because it is overwhelmingly Christian and references specific um, deities and religious figures, rather than just being a general, you know, words of affirmation or a poem or something that would be, um, you know, appealing or acceptable to people of all different religious beliefs, including non-belief. And uh, so I was in the parlor with all these amazing, tall, young women. <laughs> and when that prayer came on, it was, you know, there was real confusion, like, wait, what? We're in a government building. This is a church. Why is there a prayer? Um, there was just that sense of like, huh, this doesn't fit. And there was dissonance. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, it's always made me uncomfortable, which is why I, I boycott it. And I, I stand in the parlor because I don't want to partake in something that I believe is exclusionary and um, makes the public feel unwelcome in our secular government. So it is really important to have people that are uh, willing to speak out uh, about government entanglement of religion and public pronouncements like that opening prayer. Some of those players might have been non-religious people. Right. Oh. And But even, even religious people, I think, can bristle when they say, like, listen, this is for my private practice. This is for me and my church and, you know, my uh, belief in, in the God or uh you know, my own personal religious faith. And when the government does it, it sort of corrupts it. It really should not be um, part of the government. Well, if we, you want to have freedom from we strongly believe that at the Freedom from Religion Foundation. And Kelda, I don't know if I have talked to you about this before, but uh, one of the first lawsuits of the Freedom from Religion Foundation back in the 1980s was suing the state legislature over the fact that there were paid prayer and they would mm -hmm. leave a parking place and that was in federal court. It languished for five years. A parking place for the, for the for, chaplain? For the chaplain of yeah. the day. Right. Yeah. And it languished uh, in court for five years. It was the senior, Senator James Doyle. And then the U.S. Supreme Court handed down um, Marsh versus Chambers, which was taken by Ernie Chambers, who is a, a non-believing, um, long-time serving Nebraska state legislator. He had won that at the lower level, but then the Supreme Court said it was okay for them to bring in an unpaid chaplain, and our case got booted out. And I don't know whether they're still paying them, but I think this is very wrong, this policy. And um, we'd be happy to revisit it. <laughs> yes, well, unfortunately, I think our Supreme Court has gotten much worse on these issues. We're right. seeing just an unprecedented um, entanglement of government and, and religion, and specifically, you know, Christianity. Well, let's and talk, it should make all of us uncomfortable. Let's talk a little bit about that before we uh, go out of this segment. Um, we have daunting, uh, we face daunting challenges with the U.S. Supreme Court, especially with the issue of abortion. And in the state of Wisconsin, do you want to explain what's at stake? Sure. If Roe versus Wade is overturned or gutted and we lose those protections, Wisconsin actually already has a criminal abortion ban on the books. It has no exceptions uh, for, you know, the health of the woman, for rape, for incest. It's a more extreme than Texas's ban even. Um, and so if Roe is gone, then that 
law, which dates to 1849, mm -hmm. um, would then you know, potentially be enforceable. And so what will happen is abortion access in Wisconsin will immediately stop. And we can't repeal and, that? Well, <laughs> I've had a bill for years to try to repeal it. I tried to repeal it when we were in the assembly. Um, I tried to put it in the budget when Democrats had the majority. Um, and now my co-author, Representative Lisa Subek, and I have for the last several years been trying to um, repeal it by passing the Abortion Rights Preservation Act just to take that statute out of the books. I remember being in law school and opening my new statute books and looking down and being shocked to read that there, abortion was a crime and that it was a felony. Um, and of course, it was, it's not enforceable because of Roe versus Wade. Um, you know, generations of women have grown up knowing that we have the right to control our own bodies, and that's all at risk right now. Um, we could see that statute coming into um, attempting to be enforced again. And it would, well, it would imprison physicians who perform abortions, and it used to imprison women, but, but we were able to repeal part of that. But I do want to say that FFRF is proud that we put up a billboard in support of the Protect Women's Health Protection Act of Wisconsin. Uh, trying to get the legislators to budge, and maybe we should explain that we have ultra-religious right or uh, Republican control of our capital. We yes, to, it's heavily gerrymandered. We have to take a break right now, but when we come back, let's continue talking about religious right legislation and the problems facing those of us who care about this world. We're talking with Wisconsin Senator Kelda Royce. We'll be right back after this. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. When I first recorded that commercial back in 2014, being openly atheist in America was still fairly uncommon. Today, the fastest growing religious group in the country is the non-religious, especially among the young. That progress is heartening, but the religious pushback is fierce and the forces of Christian nationalism are well organized. Our progress won't continue unless we work together so that reason and our secular constitution will prevail. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. My name is Katie, and I am an out-of-the-closet atheist. I've never really believed in a god. Of course, there are always those moments where you wish an omnipotent being would swoop down and offer divine intervention, but ultimately, you can't reconcile that with reality. I never really liked attending church, either. When I was in grade school, I had to go five days a week and once on the weekends, and then in high school, I had to go, and I went to Catholic school the entire time. One Ash Wednesday after I got my license, I wasn't able to go to church with my family. So I told my mom I would go, but instead I drove to a park, lit the end of a stick on fire, and smudged the ashes on my forehead to prove that I had gone. Ultimately, the church's position on same-sex marriage, women's rights, and their handling of certain scandals were the final nails in the cross, so to speak. As a feminist and a humanitarian, I find it necessary to come out of the closet and declare my atheism. Welcome back to Free Thought Matters. We're continuing our conversation with Wisconsin State Senator Kelda Royce, who is openly atheist and humanist and one of at least 80 some elected officials around the country at the state, regional, and local level who publicly identify as non-religious, yet are getting elected. So, Kelda, what is it like having to deal with these and fight with these religious right legislations all the time in the state Senate? Well, it, it's very frustrating to see um, how in some ways we are really moving backwards um, with religion playing an ever greater role in state policy making. And I think about, you know, the response to COVID and, yes. you know, we have this incredible miracle of vaccines thanks to the work of, of scientists um, who got us a vaccine to save us from a deadly virus. And um, it's being undermined by people who are being misled 
purposefully by propaganda that's anti-vax and a lot of it is religious in nature and then we have people trying to use religious um you know excuses to exempt themselves from vaccine requirements to the detriment of, of all of our public health and of course here in wisconsin we've seen our democratic governor evers thwarted in many respects throughout the whole pandemic and uh, that must be very frustrating to watch as a lead, as a senator, Kelda. It is, yeah. I, you know, I think about how I'm a small business owner, and you know how small businesses have struggled, and um, you know people have come to work under incredible odds uh, and and danger to themselves, their own health, and and others. Uh, and you know how my kids, you know, even my preschooler wears a mask every day to try to protect public health. You know, we really pulled together as a community and, and, you know, overwhelmingly Wisconsinites and Americans, you know, are doing the right things. They're getting vaccinated. They're wearing masks. They're trying to be as safe as possible. And yet, you know, we're doing this with no help and often with hindering from the Republican politicians who, uh, you know, don't want to do anything in terms of financial help to help people who are struggling economically and don't want to do anything from a public health standpoint to help us get over um, these waves of pandemics. We should point out that the Freedom From Religion Foundation is nonpartisan, but we care about the issues of, of the real world. So aren't, aren't churches like super spreader events? I think part of the problem is that when you have a respiratory virus and it spreads through um, speaking and singing, you know, these are things that often happen at church, you know, and they happen at concerts. And so, um, you know, a lot of the kind of early super spreader events before we really understood how the virus was spreading were happening at, you know, at prior practice and at um, religious events. And, um, and that's why, like, you know, I couldn't go see live music, which I love to see for a year. And I couldn't go see theater because these were events that were dangerous. And, and um, in-person church uh, is the same, you know, it has the same danger. And so, yeah. uh, you know, the question is like, should they get a, an exemption from a generally applicable rule that's trying to save lives? Right, Nobody so. is, nobody's targeting churches or treating them differently. They're asking, right. many of these lawsuits um, by religious right groups and churches were asking to be exempted from, to have a privilege that somehow because they're religious, it doesn't, uh, they don't have to follow the same public health mandates. Yeah, they're subject to fire codes and building codes. And, in, in our state, you know, that's not always true, Missouri, for example. But yes, it's, it, and Kelda, what I find so frustrating is this, it's my body, my liberty, signs being wielded by anti-vax people um, who are also the same people who are anti-abortion. Hmm. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. So, somehow wearing a mask or, or getting a vaccine, you know, which has an effect on other people is somehow more of a liberty interest than being able to actually control your own body and decide if you want to have a child or not. Like I've just been through pregnancy. It is much more demanding um, and, you know, it has lifelong consequences versus just putting on my Ruth Bader Ginsburg mask and, when I go to the grocery store. Or, and, and getting a poke in the arm to protect yourself right. and other people. Well, uh, Kelda, I know you are such an advocate for separation of church and state. Could you talk about that as in, in your position as a state senator, why this is such an important principle? It's endangered what we need to do about that. Well, I think it's endangered because we have decades of court packing um, and efforts by the religious right to try to take over school boards and courtrooms, and they've been quite successful. And um, when Republicans have gained power, and I know you're nonpartisan, but I'm partisan, they've used that power to gerrymander themselves into a permanent majority. So that's what happens in Wisconsin. Even though we're a state that has equal numbers of Democrats and Republicans, and we elect people statewide from both parties and from, with a lot of different ideologies, you know, only the Republicans ever get to be in control of the legislature because they've drawn the maps. And that combined with voter suppression has really um, given us one-sided policies. And that's very dangerous because if Roe v. Wade is overturned and abortion is a crime again in Wisconsin, we don't want that. You know, over 70% of the state wants abortion to be safe and legal. Um, and that's been very consistent over time. That's true throughout this country. 
And yet there's no way politically um, for us to make our voices heard on that because uh, the you know religious right has successfully captured so much power and been able to um, dominate the Republican Party in these primaries in these heavily gerrymandered seats. Can we make the um, maps more fair? Well, uh, you know, we kind of have our our hopes set on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. They they've agreed to um, accept maps that I think are um, based on a standard that has we've never had before, which is a least change from the existing maps. Um, so we know that the whatever maps we get are going to still be gerrymandered because they're going to reflect the illegitimate ten years ago process from the previous gerrymander. Um, that said, populations have changed, and so I do think that um, under the new maps, um, hopefully we'll have more opportunity for fair representation. So what are the solutions here? There's a lot of problems and challenges. Uh, we have about a minute left. Um, that's a final word with some optimism. Well, yeah, we. I mean, the, I think the really exciting thing is that people are with us on these issues, right? More and more people don't want to see government entanglement with religion, and they do want to see government tackling the real big challenges that we're facing from climate to health and the economy. And um, so that's where we need to focus our efforts. And, you know, what, what the religious right wants more than anything is for us to just uh, figure that it's hopeless and go home. But what we need to do as an antidote to that is knock on doors, get engaged, and continue to be involved and hold our legislators accountable and keep talking about these issues because that is how we're going to change the world. Well, we're so glad that you're there to help change the world, uh, Senator Kelda Royce, and for joining us today and for being among the growing number of public officials at state, local levels especially, who are willing to come clean and admit that you're not religious and that you're a good American too. So good to be with you both. Thank you. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because free thought matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.